So, my name is Nicole Clark. I was a Peace Corps volunteer from 2000 to 2003. I lived on one of the outer islands. I lived actually on the northernmost island of Kitabis, and uh, it's called Makin. I was a teacher there. Um, now, I do live in the Bay Area. I am one of the NorCal board members, as well as being a college and career coach and teaching university here and there. Hi, my name is Kim Powell, and I was also an education volunteer. I did middle school teaching and teacher training on the island of Onotua, which is one of the islands south of the equator. I was there from end of, uh, end of 2000, uh, 1998 to 2000. And um, I have two kids, and I'm a math teacher at school for kids with learning challenges, and I have a private practice, and I tutor maths as well. And when I was in Kitabis, I, I wasn't aware, I don't remember being aware at the time of um, global warming and I had definitely no idea that the islands that I was living on would one day, and maybe possibly in my lifetime, be underwater. It just didn't occur to me. I was just completely immersed in what I was doing there. I loved my piece Can you just speak up all of the noise that's coming in from outside? And if you have a mic, you can have much more. Thank you. Okay. Bear with me as I get used to the mic. Okay, okay, very close. Okay. Oh, done. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so, um, let's see. Oh, so, I, well, my school experience, I went back and visited after having been gone for a year and a half, and at that time I was on a mission to meet somebody who knew a kid of this person in Northern California so that I could stay connected once I got um, back home. And I was given a business card of this woman, um, Belaya. Crosby, who is a Kinnabis woman who lives in the States. She's born and raised in Kinnabis, though. She's married to an American man. And at the time I was given this business card, I had no idea it sort of hit the jackpot. She's the unofficial mayor of all Kinnabis people in the United States. <laughs> Everyone seems to know her. All the Peace Corps volunteers somehow get connected to her. There's different groups of um, Kinnabis people living in the States, and every year they all tend to be able to gather together to celebrate their independence, um, which is a but like the biggest holiday in Kittibus, and this is in July. And um, so it's nice to be able to get together with them as they're preparing for that and singing songs and, and doing local dances. And last year they got together in Northern California again, and no way was the MC of that event. And also at that time, Nicole and I got pretty connected. I got married and had kids and pretty much lost touch with all things Kittibus for a few years. So it's nice to be able to bring my family there and introduce them to this life that I've had. And we had the chance to meet um, Margarita Barro, who is the UN ambassador to Kitabis, who joined us at the celebration for a little bit. And she was able to speak with us about um, climate change and how it's affecting Kitabis right now. And she was actually preparing to go to, um, to New York City for a big, um, such a big, big summit, big summit on um, climate change. So that was all happening last year. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, when I first went to Kitabis in 2000, I was well aware that global warming was going to be an issue in these islands. Um, but at the time, scientists were projecting years that had me thinking that in my retirement, this was going to be, I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing when I'm retiring. I'm going to, you know, bring my grandkids and, you know, we're going to all, you know, rally together to help the people that live in the islands. And um, I'm in my 30s now, and it, the time is now. Um, and it's becoming very evident that um, these people are, they are going to have to leave their homes in my lifetime. Um, so. So first, I want to um, talk a little bit about where cannabis is. Um, for one, it's pronounced Kiribati. I say cannabis because I'm from the Northern Island, and it's kind of like someone from the South here in the United States talking, so um, I have a strong accent when I speak. Um, but Kiribati is actually the way that the um, Islanders said the name Gilberts. Um, back in the day, because it was the Gilbert Islands and a British protectorate at one time. Um, you can see in this map right here, there's a yellow area. It's three island chains that are there. That yellow area is roughly the um, size of the United States. If you were to go from the east to the west coast. Um, as you can see, it has a very small land mass, but it has the biggest um, EEZ, or the biggest ocean area 
um, of any country in the world. So most of what you see when you are in Kitabas is ocean. Um, also, these islands, really the highest point is three meters above sea level, and on average it's two meters. Um, two meters is about six foot six inches. I'm about six foot, so um, just a little bit higher than me is actually the average elevation on these islands. Um, the population is um, spread out over about 21 of the islands. Um, but there's only about 100, 100 a little less than 105,000 people. And half of those people are in the capital island, and actually they're in, you can see in the red part over here, this is the south part of the island called um, South Tarawa. Half the population lives in that red area. Um, and so, um, according to the World Bank, it actually has a higher population density than Tokyo. Um, and when you think about Tokyo, you think of like skyscrapers and uh, very large apartment complexes. Um, we don't have that in cannabis. You know, two stories is about as high as things go there. So um, there's a lot of people living in a very small area. They say that the coconut tree, the kids people have 100 uses for the coconut tree. It's their food, um, toddies, they, they drink that, they can like, ferment their alcohol, can boil it for boil it for hours, and it's sweet syrup. So it's a lot of, um, it's a big source of food for them. And they, um, the men that are collecting these coconut trees and doing the, not the coconut trees, <laughs> collecting the coconuts, um, they let it dry in the sun, and that's called tide, that's called, um, Cobra, and they sell this as part of their economy. Um, so the men are doing all the physical work and, and eating the same diet of coconuts and fish and rice as the women, but the women are pretty much doing the laundry by hand and um, the wash and just not as active. So the men are pretty good, they're very fit. And the women are um, not as active, don't get as healthy once they, they get married. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they think that's great and they're very, they're very happy with the way things are there and easy going, happy, you know, lifestyle. And um, traditions are a huge part of, of, of how they live and respecting their ancestors. Their meeting places have huge roofs that um, have like, the spirits of their ancestors up inside them. And their roofs come down and low to the ground so you can bow down to the ancestors as you enter. And um, the, their, the coconut tree I was talking about also provides their housing. The, the trunks of the trees are the base of the house, and the palm frond sticks are their the sticks, and um, they weave the palm frond leaves for their um, shade structures and for mats. And, um, and like I said, part of the economy too. So the coconut, the, their lives sort of revolves around the coconut tree. Um, and fishing is, is just huge. The women do net fishing and they go out and they are some of the best fishermen in the world with just a line on their toe and just hanging out in a canoe. On my first time fishing, it wasn't very long before there was a shark below. I was like, shark, shark, and they weren't raised at all. I just switched to a different, a stronger hook and pulled them up and there you go. I had my first sushi on that boat too and they caught a tuna and just handed me some raw fish and said, take some of that with some coconuts. I said, okay. <laughs> Tate Tong, who has been um, the president since 2003, and he is um, well loved by his people. He has been um, traveling the world, and he has been making pleas to many uh, in many different communities to explain about you know their their home and about what their needs are. Um, he says that um, he's the early um, the early warning system for the world. You know, and this is going to start happening in cannabis and in some of the other Pacific Islands, um, but this is only the beginning. This is really going to um, spread to other countries and, and to other peoples. Okay, let's go this um, What's really to um, to Anur Tetong, but also and also to his people, is to move with dignity and to move as empowered people, 
um, and to be able to take care of themselves and not to leave their land as environmental refugees. Um, but I wanted to specifically point out what um, the effects of global, global warming and of climate change are on the island. Um, one is what most people think of when they think of rising sea levels. You're like, oh, the oceans are getting higher. Oh, that means that erosion is going to happen and that, you know, waves will start coming a little bit closer maybe to my house, as you can see um, in this picture. Um, also, just that, you know, there's going to be more, more water around you. Um, something else that we're seeing a lot of is storms. Um, cannabis is right, you know, it's right on the equator. It's right where the international dateline and the equator intersect. So it has traditionally been in a very calm place. Um, called, often it was called the doldrums, if anyone has heard that term. Um, we've read about it in like ancient books, you know, or ancient texts where they talk about the ships that all of a sudden the wind is gone and they no longer are moving. And, you know, they don't know if they will ever make it out of this land, you know, or this, this area alive. Um, and that was because the doldrums are so calm. Well, that is not necessarily the case anymore. Um, in March of this year, Cyclone Pam came through, and it was devastating to many of the southern islands, um, as well as some other countries. Vanuatu was hit pretty hard as well. Um, Cyclone Pam, um, was considered the biggest storm in 30 years. It also was considered bigger than, Sam, than Sandy that we had here and Katrina um, as well. If you look at this picture, and I know it's hard, this is a picture uh, that, was, that was taken, a satellite image that NASA did. Um, this actually covers most of the southern islands in the region. <laughs> so, um, so it's a very large storm that came through and um, had devastating effects on the islands. Um, something else that happens is because of that um, very fragile um, fresh water lens, you start getting saltwater intrusion. And so that is when the salt water starts to come over the land and it actually sinks into the, um, to the water lens and it makes the water brackish. Um, makes the water undrinkable um, and also affects the plants that are growing in the region. So in this image, you can see the coconut trees that, um, that Kim was talking about, this very important staple for these people. And um, the salt, they can't grow in salt water. Um, they, you know, so this is, this is what ends up happening. Um, and again, this is their food, this is their wealth, you know, their economy is based on this on many islands, um, and this is also how they build infrastructure. Something else that starts happening is um, as the sea levels um, begin to actually increase in temperature, or as the sea begins to increase in temperature, um, it really affects the coral. Um, and the coral is, you know, a very important um, part of these islands. Not only are the islands made up of this, but um, the fish that live in the coral are, you know, a big part of their diet. Um, and the, um, the coral itself is where, you know, fish live in that ecosystem. This is not just happening in cannabis. If you guys have been to Hawaii recently, <laughs> you've seen probably some bleached coral. Um, if you go to the Keys down in Florida, bleached coral. Um, if you've been, you know, in the news recently, there's been a lot of issues with the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. I mean, these are problems that are happening globally. <laughs> um, but it's really apparent in cannabis because these people depend so much um, on this. Another effect of um, climate change in cannabis is the decrease in frequency of the king tides. So the tides are always changing, and especially with the new moon and a full moon, and um, these king tides are the, the biggest of the big tide, the high tides of the whole year. And um, historically, those happen uh, a few times a year, but they've been, weather patterns change and they've been increasing, and um, the damage is growing up um, over time. 
So we'll take a look at what this looks like. Essentially, a tsunami um, hitting these these lands because it's so so close to the sea level. You can see the waves coming, and there we go. On a coconut tree, everybody has a skill to do that, but clearly that's not a long term solution. It's just an interesting thing about Right here, it's a paved road, so we know that we're on the capital there, picture to the left. But all islands have roads and parts of that where you can just like the where the lagoon and the uh, ocean are. So there's it's very narrow. And I think in most islands, the widest part is only a 10 to 20 minute walk across. Yeah, so they're not very wide, so there's there's nowhere to go when they're not very high above sea level. Um, there's the Taro um, pit that Nicole was talking about. The crops can't survive, and um, the trees can't survive either. And all of this, um, all of this salt water is causing uh, change in disease patterns. So there's always been um, certain um, stomach issues with people in cannabis, but dengue fever is something that was very rare and now is becoming more common. Dehydration is um, currently quite an issue. Um, so a question that might come to mind is, wow, you know, there's all of this happening in this country, so what is the government doing to um, really, you know, help their people? Um, and they have put together a three-part plan, um, and this started, you know, it took a little while, I think, for, you know, for people to really believe that this was happening, um, and to really see what was happening. I mean, still, it, um, here in the United States, I know there's still some controversy around whether climate change is for real. Um, <laughs> probably not so much in this room, um, but definitely in our country, this is um, still something that we're talking about. So um, in cannabis, it was the same way. Um, in 2005, they, um, they started to really put together a plan. Um, when I was there in 2000, actually my second year there, um, the World Bank did come in and I was actually a translator for the World Bank um, in translating their message to the government saying, hey, well, we want to loan you a lot of money to um, really, you know, to do, you know, put in all of this infrastructure that you need. Um, Kidavis couldn't really afford to do that at the time, um, but in 2005 they started um, working on and this is the plan that they currently have. Um, they started first with mitigation. And they were like, okay, so climate change is an issue. What can we do to stop climate change? Um, they did a big study, and they found that they had the lowest CO2 emissions in the world, except one other country. And they were like, wow, oh, okay. Um, so we can't really lower our carbon footprint. Um, and they realized that they were actually really dependent on the rest of the world to, you know, to help them in lowering their own car their carbon footprint to then help, you know, the nation of Kitabes. Um, so they were like, okay, mitigation may be, maybe not going to work for us, except for through awareness um, to other people and other nations specifically. Um, they are currently in the adaptation um, part of their plan. Now, and there's three parts to the plan, and um, they're very detailed in their steps. Um, but what the adaptation part really is, is it is looking at their own infrastructure, and it is saying, hey, okay, we need to start putting in rain catchment systems. Um, and that's great, especially in the Northern Islands that do get rain. Um, Southern Islands don't get so much rain, so it's more challenging. Um, but they're also putting in mangroves. You know, and helping to really build up the infrastructure of the island um, through those root systems. Um, they are also building seawalls in places where they can help to protect villages um, and help to protect the people who are there. They're also um, looking at some different ways of actually kind of building their islands with some of the excess trash that they have. Um, on islands dealing with trash is a big issue. So um, they're starting to actually build infrastructure that way. They, um, they've been fortunate. They've had um, funding from the UN. They've had funding from US 
it's USAID, from the Australia AID, from the World Bank. Um, they have been, and other NGOs that are in the area. So um, they've been starting to kind of garner funds for that infrastructure building. Um, but really, the um, the old the the ultimate the final step of this plan is migration. And as I mentioned earlier, um, this is something that is inevitable. Um, this is something that is going to have to happen to the, for these people, with these people, and um, they're, they're really trying to um, create their, their plan um, and figure out where it is that they are going to go. It's hard to start looking around and be like, okay, where do we, you know, we have 105,000 people, How, where are we going to take them? 105,000. Um, and um, so then, you know, and I was thinking about that, like, what is that? You know, like, that's about this population of Berkeley, actually. Um, as long as you stay within the, you know, Berkeley city limits. Um, but these are also people that have been, you know, subsistence livers for, um, you know, for their, most of their lives. Um, some things that are in place right now are that they did buy a little bit less than 6,000 acres of land in Fiji. Um, but, and that is actually kind of like, that's like twice the um, amount of land that they do have in South Tarawa right now, but, um, but it's not quite big enough to um, house all of their people. They're looking at that as more of an agricultural um, development place so that they can continue to feed their people as this saltwater intrusion happens um, on many of the islands. Um, they have also been putting together some training programs. Um, Australia has a, one of their universities has put together a great nursing program. Um, and so they're trying to figure out how to make sure that their people are skilled. If they're going to move and they're going to have to move, they're, they're going to need skills that are going to help to carry them into this, this Western, Western style of world. So a letter was sent, um, maybe these were volunteer, trans volunteers signed this letter and was sent to the um, president of Kittibus and to the UN ambassador to Kittibus, just stating that we all served in the uh, Peace Corps in Kittibus for two years and love this country and this culture. We want to help, and we're just pledging our, our support. Please let us know how we can help. The next step was um, Becky did some fundraising for um, the money to start a nonprofit, Kittibus Keepers. So now Kittibus Keepers is an official nonprofit with 501 C3 status. So now that we are moving into our fundraising stage, um, any donations that we collect will be um, tax deductible or official now. With the climate march in New York City, um, many of these island nations, you know, participated in the march and you know flags and they're, um, you know, we're really showing the world what they need, that they don't have all the agreements that they need in place yet. I think certain countries are responsible for some of these island nations, I don't know if responsible is the right word, but like I think Australia is, takes care of cannabis in a way, they get, so they get all the foreign products from, so I think different countries have different partners who are, I think are going to be helping. Um, and well, in Australia is helping, but they have not agreed to take their people in. <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, I have a really quick comment when you said that people in America or people around here don't really see the effects of climate change. We're in a five-year drought, which is directly climate change. That is climate change, guys. If you're from this area and you don't believe in it, we're in a five-year drought. Accept it. Anyway, sorry, just had to get on my soapbox for a second. Also, you said you mentioned that they were planting mangroves in efforts to protect the land. Are mangroves, uh, this is a multi-part question, are mangroves a native species in the mountains? Mm -hmm. Do they grow naturally? Uh, they do grow in some islands. They are not, they were not an, a plant that I saw read all over um, the Cadabas Islands. It was something that they were bringing in to help hold the land together. you know, 
know, their wish is that they can move to a place and they can keep their culture, their government, you know, their government, their, you know, their way of life really intact. Um, as of right now, there is no solution. There, that is, you know, they haven't found how to make that happen. Um, but definitely, that is. I mean, that's that's what they want. Um, and Note Tom talks about um, really wanting to, you know, let his people, you know, help his people move and be empowered through this move, and to be moved to a new place with the skills, you know, and the tools that they need to really be successful in this in a new land. Um, and his greatest fear is that they will have to move as environmental refugees. And that's why he is really, you know, putting the word out um, to the global community now to say, okay, you know, now is the time that we need to all work together and figure out, you know, figure out how to make this a successful move. Because, yes, this is happening in Kitabis, this is happening in Tokelau and the Maldives and Tuvalu, but these are only the first nations that this is going to happen to. You know, we look at our own, even our own keys in Florida, you know, those are those small atolls down there aren't going to be around for <laughs> how much longer. But yes, we have a lot more money um, and we have a lot more tools for infrastructure um, so things can last a bit longer. Yes. Well, it certainly occurs to me that one huge challenge of, of the migration is say there are 100,000 people all together, but they've never lived all together in one place. They have always lived in very small groups. So they moved to, so they got, you know, maybe they got double the acreage that, that Fiji was willing to give, and it was enough to actually house that many people. That's a huge challenge for them to live together in a different way than they had before. And, uh, you know, it's just down the road, there's just huge, huge challenges. I, I, it's not really a question, but just a, something that occurred to me when we were talking about it. Yeah. Well, I'd like to propose that if their people are going to move, their local language may not, it's not going to be what's needed. What's being done to teach people English so that when they have to move and go somewhere else, they'll have a language that they can talk with people outside of their area? Is that in the capital there, we've seen pictures of uh, children holding signs um, and posted on Facebook, um, pleading to the international community to just take notice of cannabis. I think that uh, more is happening in the capital right now. Um, several years ago, when I first heard that cannabis wasn't going to be around in 50 years, um, a friend of mine in the capital had Gmail, and I, I was like, instant messaging her, which is pretty amazing to me. And she, I, she said, yeah, the president's going to want us to, to leave, but we're staying. You know, like there's still the mindset there that um, but, but you know, that was several years ago, so when, when you were on to an island just now and your island's flooded, you have evidence that, oh my goodness, things are really happening. So I think, um, you know, especially some of the, the older community there, um, I mean, it's their land, so they don't want to leave. So it's just a long Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Kittimus language was actually written by the same missionaries that wrote the Hawaiian language. Um, and in Hawaiian, there are no S's, um, and so when they, they took the same, the very same alphabet after putting together the Hawaiian language, and 13 letters, and brought it to Kitabis, and they wrote, then, you know, proceeded to write, you know, the Kitabis language there. Um, so T-I's um, became, are pronounced like an S. Um, and it's actually really interesting because they also don't use the L. There is no L in the Kitabis language, um, whereas in Hawaiian you see a lot of L. So it was not really a great fit for the alphabet to go from Hawaiian to Kitabis, but, um, but I know it was helpful for me in learning the language to have it written down. G's is a K. So the Gilbert T's, it's Kitabis C. It's as close as you can get with 13 letters. <laughs> I know research has shown through various studies that statistics are not very effective at persuading people to change behavior, but emotional stories are. So I'm wondering if RPCVs have a role to play in getting kind of the individual stories out to let people know, you know U.S. actions are affecting people's homes and families. 
That is, you know, that's a great point. So I don't know if everybody heard that about using uh, stories and really using, you know, kind of the showing the personal side of um, what's happening um, to families and to people in cannabis. Um, and that's a big part of what, that's one of our really our first steps is awareness. Um, I think people don't realize what's happening in other, in, in a lot, you know, a lot of these specific island nations and um, we, and the cannabis keepers, and um, you know, we that awareness is one really the first. I think the first step, and um, and also showing. Um, I had it up there before, but that there are cute kids, and, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and great families, and you know, I mean, there's amazing people in this culture.